Happy New Year's. Do you have a good New Year's celebration, good Christmas celebration? We celebrated Christmas yesterday. And so we, we had a full day yesterday. And we, are, uh, we got up early this morning to come down here. I wouldn't have missed church for anything. And what, a best, what, what, what better way to start the New Year's off on the 1st of January, the first day of the year, to come to church. Look at God's Word, sing praises to Him, celebrate the Lord's Supper. This is the last of the sermon series uh, for Advent and Christmas season and New Year's. And the, the, the title is, Is Being Good Enough? Is being good enough? Is that all we need? Is just to be good? We've looked at decorating with purpose. Uh, great, greet each other. It's great. Sometimes you write things and it doesn't show up on spell check. Greet. Greet, not great. Greet each other with love, gathering with families and friends, gift of money, money honoring Christmas all year long this morning. Is being, is being good enough? And uh, this is one of the messages when I ask people, what would you like to hear? It was this one here for some reason. And I don't know why, but it's a great way to start the New Year's. And I checked some of these statistics, and they're still pretty, pretty relevant for our, and pretty accurate for even our day. If 99.9% .9 is good enough, you, you've seen the Lysol commercials, kills 99.9% .9 of germs, right? Right? 99.9%. .9 wow! This must be good enough. <laughs> if 99.9% .9 is good enough, guess what? Over 2 million documents will be lost by the IRS this coming year. Hope it's mine. <laughs> Hope it's yours. Uh, okay, moving on. If 99.9% .9 is good enough, then 22,000 financial transactions will be deducted from the wrong bank account in the next 60 minutes. Ooh. Or 1,314 telephone calls will be misdirected by the telecommunication companies every minute. If 99.9% .9 was good enough. If 99.9% .9 is good enough, then 2,488 books will be shipped with the wrong covers on them each day. The wrong covers. Over 5.5 million cases of soft drinks in the next year would be flat. If 99.9% .9 is good enough. If 99.9% .9 is good enough, 20,000 incorrect prescriptions would be written each year. 20,000. And 12 babies will be given to the wrong parents each day. Ooh. So I ask you, is being good enough? Obviously, being good is not good enough for today's life. So why is it that we think being good enough is good enough to get to heaven? Why do we think that? If it's not good for our lives here, why do we think it's good enough for us to get into heaven? And now, we've all heard people ask questions like this. If I try my best, won't God let me into heaven? Or, doesn't God just require me to be better than the average human being? Or, don't I, don't I have to just live a good life to be a Christian? And this is, this is my all-time favorite, all-time all things I've, I've heard all the time. How could a loving God send good people to hell? That's, a, that's the, the top number one question. If being good is good enough, how could a loving God send good people to hell? I'm going to tell you. Just to, I'm going to answer that question. Martin Luther, the reformer. You know Martin Luther? It started the Reformation period uh, about 600 years ago now. He wrote the most damnable and pernicious heresy that has ever plagued the mind of people is the idea that somehow 
We can make ourselves good enough to deserve to live with an all, good enough to live in an all holy God. Then he goes on to says, anyone is, everyone is incurably addicted to doing something for their own salvation. So let's examine what the Bible has to say about being good enough, okay? Not what I say, but what the Bible says, what God says about it. You know, I turned to the last page of my sermon. I bet you that would make you happy, right? <laughs> what does the Bible say about being good? Number one, you ready for this? Write this down. God's standard is perfection. God's standard is perfection. In one sense, to be good enough, in one sense, to be good enough to get to heaven, one must be, say the word, perfect. On one occasion, Jesus identified two of the most, two of the most outwardly religious groups of his day. And he says this, But I warn you, unless your righteousness is better than the righteousness of the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. These were the leaders, the religious leaders of his day. They outwardly projected righteousness, holiness. And yet Jesus says, unless you're better than them, you're not going to enter the kingdom of heaven. And if good enough is, was good enough, this group probably would have made it, but good enough is not good enough. On another occasion, Jesus says this, but you are to be perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. Did you hear what Jesus is saying? <coughs> The world and most and many Christians, I'm sorry, self-proclaimed Christians. I need to make sure I say this right. Many in the world and many self-proclaimed Christians says, you know, Jesus says we are to be as perfect as God himself is perfect. That's impossible. So good enough has got to be good enough. And I'm here to tell you, it ain't good enough. It just isn't. God's standard never falls short of complete righteousness and holiness. Anything less than perfection means what? You're not good enough. Not good enough. Oh, let's use, let's use a biblical word. If you're watching on YouTube, here's the biblical word. It's called sin. When you're not good enough, it's called sin. We fall short of perfection. Think about heaven for a minute. Think about the place in heaven where there's no mores. Heaven is a place of no mores, right? No more tears, no more, no more pain, no more sadness, no more sickness, no more death. All of those things are caused by the root cause of sin, right? The root, the root cause is sin. So, heaven is a place of no mores. It, things like this do not exist because sin does not exist in heaven. So, if being good is good enough, what would that mean if we went to heaven being good enough? I don't have a statistic for that. But chances are, I don't see anybody getting into he heaven unless they're perfect. Heaven would be wonderful. Not only because of who's there, but what's not. Who's there is God, and what's not is sin. Now listen, God's standard never falls short of complete righteousness and holiness, and God's standard of perfection is not arbitrary. What does that mean, arbitrary? It means that God does not grade on the curve. God does not grade on the curve. Anybody been in school and have one or two people 
just blow the curve right out of the water, right? It's not arbitrary. He doesn't say, oh, <laughs> you were very, very close. And I know how hard you tried to live a good life, but well, come on in anyway. See, God does not compare. Who compares? We compare ourselves with others. You know, it's interesting. We'll compare ourselves to others, but we certainly won't compare ourselves to a holy and righteous God. Why is that? Why is that? Oh, sin. I'm sorry. Did I mention that we have sin in our lives? God doesn't say, Well, Coy, you're better than John. Come on in. He goes, he goes, Lottie, you're better than Bobby. Come on in. He, 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 he doesn't do that. He's not arbitrary. That would be like us trying to jump the Grand Canyon. Anybody been to the Grand Canyon? It's pretty, it's pretty long to get across. So you decide, and you've been practicing, you've been working out. Hey, your New Year's resolution is to work out a little bit more. So you take off and you jump, and it's, it is a world record long jump. I mean, nobody in the world jumped further than you did. Where are you going to end up? In the bottom of the canyon, just like everybody else. Do you see the, you, you, you get the picture? You can be good enough and still be splattered a mile down in that canyon. So how's that working out for you? Now listen, for the most part, listen, I want you to hear this. For the most part, I think everybody in this room is pretty good. Listen to me. I think many of us are pretty good. I mean, does anybody here have wants and warrants out for murder? Anybody? I don't think so. I don't think anybody have any warrants out for, for, for an arrest, do you? Or for assault? So if we're grading ourselves on goodness, I think we could rate ourselves pretty high in goodness. So let's, let's pretend for just a moment, okay, that you are part of the decent family. Mr. and Mrs. Decent, okay? And so you, it, he's a decent husband, he's a decent wife, you got decent kids. You following me? From our perspective, we do everything right. We pay our taxes, we pay our bills. We're part of the decent family. We pay attention to our families, we re respect our superiors. We're just good people. We're decent people. God sees us differently. God sees what the decent family chooses to overlook. For as decent as we may be walking through life, we make mistakes. We make mistakes. Anybody here make any mistakes yet this morning? You know, don't, you know, don't raise your hand. I, I don't want to embarrass you. We all have. For example, maybe we stretch the truth just a bit. Maybe we fudge ever so slightly on an expensive report. And we, we certainly don't gossip too much about the new employee that just came on board. Or the new person who just joined the organization. From our perspective, these aren't big deals. But our perspective does not matter. But it does to God. And what God sees is a person wrapped up in mistakes. I'm a person wrapped up in mistakes. So let me ask you, is there any mistakes in your life? Guess what? Join the club of sinners. Right? And if that's right, if you're not perfect, you haven't met God's standard for, perfe uh, per for perfection. Okay, now what do we do? So what is God's standard? Say the word. Perfection. We have failed to meet that. Correct? We are people who make mistakes. True? 
Are we agree? We're good, decent people who make mistakes. Are we okay with that? And we, the Bible calls that sinners. Hmm, okay. So, what's the solution? God has a solution. God's solution is a pardon. God's solution is the pardon. God's solution is a pardon. That is the remedy for our imperfection. It is a pardon that we, that's only found in Jesus. And here's how it works. The writer of Hebrews says this in, in, in chapter 10. Christ made a single sacrifice for sins. Let's, let's, put, it, let's, put, it, let's put it in a term maybe that's... Because, you know, sometimes I would say the word sin and people turn me off. Okay? Pay attention. Christ made a single sacrifice for those who make mistakes, which the Bible calls sin. And that was it. That, that's, that's his solution. It was a perfect sacrifice by a perfect person to perfect some very imperfect people. By that single offering, he did everything that needed to be done. Sins are taken care of for good. Do you get it? The Apostle Paul describes it this way in 2 Corinthians. For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sins, so that we could be made right with God through Christ. Is that clear? So here's an illustration, if it's not clear. R.G. Lee, a former pastor of Bellevue Baptist Church in Memphis, Tennessee, was visiting the place called Gordon's Calvary in Jerusalem. We were there. If you would go to Jerusalem, you would go to the Church of the Holy Sepulcher, and you'll see all the ornate type stuff that's there. It's pretty, it's gaudy, it's crowded. It's historically, historically, it may be somewhat accurate, Calvary, and the grave might be right there. But we went to a place called Gordon's, um, was it Gordon's Mount, Gordon's um, Calvary. And it, it's another possible site for Christ, but it's, it's not ornate, ornate at all. But it gives us an illustration of what Calvary might have been like in Jesus' day. And Pastor Lee decided he wanted to climb that hill up to the top of that mountain, that little mountain. And at first the, 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 the guide tried to discourage him, but he saw Lee was determined to go and he went along. Once on the crest, Lee removed his hat and stood and bowed his head because he was greatly moved. And the guy said, Sir, have you been here before? The pastor says, Yes, over 2,000 years ago. See, we need to understand. You need to, we need to understand that we have been to Calvary. We were there. We were there because our sins were nailed to the cross where Jesus was hung. Our sins, your mistakes. And now we go there, and what do we find? We find redemption. We find a pardon for our mistakes, for our sins. And when it comes to salvation, whether we are more like Hitler or more like Mother Teresa, our sins are no longer the issue. The issue is what are we going to do about Jesus? That's the issue. Jesus is God's solution to our not measuring up to his standard. Jesus has already paid the price for our sins, for our mistakes. Jesus is the perfect sacrifice, as the Bible said, to perfect person, to perfect a person, to perfect, I'm sorry, I messed that up. Jesus is the perfect sacrifice by a perfect person to perfect some imperfect people. 
Jesus now offers, a, offers us a pardon. He offers us a release from sin. Are you following me so far? What's God's standard? What's God's solution? A pardon. So God is offering us a pardon from this sin. Now, so think about it this way. If a criminal was handed a pardon that would le release him or her from the prison, the issue is no longer what crime did the criminal commit, it's what's he going to do with the pardon. Are you following me so far? If he refuses the pardon, what happens? He stays in prison. And the, qu and the question is this, why is he in prison? And why isn't he out of prison? They both have two different answers. He's in prison because what? Because he'd been convicted of a crime that made him a criminal. He made a mistake, and he's paying for that mistake by being in prison. We call them criminals. Why is he still in prison? Why isn't he out? Because he refused the pardon. Are you following me so far? Are you, are you getting the picture here? Likewise, the answer to the question, why will good people be in hell? It's because one is a sinner, okay? And two, they have not accepted the pardon for God's solution. How much clearer can that be? The answer to the question, will that person be, not be in heaven? One didn't... The reason people aren't going to heaven is because they're not accepting the pardon. They're not accepting Christ into their lives. Good people who are imperfect are going to hell because they refuse the pardon. Duh! It's New Year's Day. Can we catch that? Rick Easel, and I want to... I want to preface this. We have a guy by the name of Kevin Easel who is president of the North American Mission Board. Rick Easel is a pastor in, in uh, Greer, Georgia. Where's Greer? Anyway, someplace in the south. And many years ago, a young boy shot and killed a man. This is his story. This is Illus. This is his story. Don't know that it's true. But it's his story, and I'm going to tell it his way. And in those days, murderers were sentenced to be hung, or to hang. Is it hung or hang? You, anyway. But the townspeople were so concerned for this young, this young guy that they gathered a petition to ask the judge to pardon the boy. And finally, the judge agreed, but under, only under one condition. See, the judge would wear a clergy outfit, robe and collar, and carry the pardon between the pages of his Bible. So the judge approached the boy. He could hear the young man cursing and swearing at him. Get out of here, preacher. I don't want what you have to offer. But son, the judge replied, you don't understand. I understand just fine, the boy said. I don't want what you have to offer. The dejected judge left the cell, left the jail, and later the guard told the boy that was the judge, who was dressed as a minister, and between the pages of the Bible, he was authorized a sealed pardon for, for your release. He told the, he told the little boy, the, the, the lad, not a little boy, young man. When the day of execution arrived, just before they uh, put the black sack over his head, they asked him if he had anything to reply, any, anything in, to say, and he replied this, I'm not dying because I killed a man, I'm dying because I rejected the pardon. That young man came to realize his situation. There are many people today who are dying and going to hell because they, they are rejecting God's pardon in their lives. Do you understand what I'm saying? Some of us, some of us are still people who make mistakes. Right? I am a sinner, but I have accepted God's pardon for my life. 
See, God does not send people to hell. The word people is neutral, implying innocence. Nowhere does the scripture teach that innocent people are condemned. People, go to, people don't go to hell. Sinners go to hell. The rebellious go to hell. The self-centered go to hell. Those of us who make mistakes are sinners and go to hell. Did I say that? Maybe we ought to preach about hell more than we preach about heaven. Amen. The one who rejects God, the people who reject the sinners, the people who make mistakes, who reject God's pardon, go to hell. So how can a loving God send good people to hell? He doesn't. He simply honors their choice. He simply honors their choice. What are you choosing this morning? So, God's standard is what? Perfection. God's, God's solution is a pardon. And listen to this. God's salvation is through a personal faith. Through personal faith. What, what must we do? We must, by faith, accept Jesus' finished work on the cross as God's only accepted way into heaven. That's pretty narrow-minded. <laughs> if, you're, if you're a condemned person in, in, in uh, you know, waiting execution, and they have a pardon for you, oh no, I don't want the pardon, I'll die. That doesn't make sense. But we have good people all day long rejecting God's solution. God's salvation is through a personal faith in Jesus, and we must trust what he has done for us. You know what? Somebody counted 11 major religions throughout the world. Now, I'm sure there's probably more. But out of the 10 that has, uh, out of the 11 that has been, has been identified, the uh, 10 of them deals with some sort of work to get to heaven. The five pillars of, uh, the five pillars of one faith. Uh, you know, you have to have like 19 wives. I don't know what you do with, I don't, I have difficulty maintaining one. <laughs> You know, but here's, I, I, only one relies on personal faith. Only one. Christianity stands alone on faith rather than works. Paul says, it is by God's grace that you have been saved through faith. It is not a result of your own effort. But a, God, but a gift from God. But God's gift, so no one can boast about it. Salvation is a gift. We don't work for it. We don't deserve it. We don't earn it. It's a gift. Last, last, yesterday morning, as the kids were opening their Christmas presents, because we didn't have Christmas on Christmas Day, we had it last yesterday. As they're opening the presents, some of those kids didn't deserve what they got. They, they didn't, they didn't, you know what I'm trying to say. I love my grandkids. But they got something they didn't deserve because they had loving parents that gave them gifts. God loves you and says, you made a mistake. I've got a solution for you. I've got a pardon. Here's the gift. And we leave it underneath the Christmas tree. There's a sad, I think this is a sad, people think this is a sweet uh, sentiment in the show. It's called Monk. Anybody remember Monk? That quirky, uh, that quirky uh, detective. Okay. His wife is killed. And on one of the Christmas shows, he still has a gift wrapped up by his wife because she died before Christmas. 
And here's the sad part about it. Don't know how long she's been dead. She's been dead a while, but he has yet to unwrap that gift. He has no idea what his wife left him. And guess what? She, she wasn't going to come back. But that gift is useless in that package that is all wrapped up. And I'm thinking, how sad is that? To be so stuck in your past that you're unable to open the gift that somebody loves you so much to give to you. We are stuck sometimes in the past of our mistakes. We've, got, we've made mistakes way back in the past, and we're still living with those mistakes today. And God has given us a freshly wrapped gift in Jesus, a pardon. It's all wrapped up, ready to go. And we've yet, not yet even taken the wrapping off the paper, the paper off the package and opened it up to receive that gift. Oh, we took the gift. We took the package. But what good is it if you don't open up and receive the gift that's inside? Do you see what I'm trying to say? It's like medicine. There are certain medicines that will help you. It will help you. But until you trust it enough to take it, it's not going to do you any good. Faith is more than just believing God. Listen. Satan believes in Jesus. You understand what I'm saying? Satan believes in Jesus. He's a fallen angel. He knows all about Jesus. He's got his rear end handed to him once. He's going to get it again here soon. Okay? Faith is trusting in him to the point of receiving Jesus into your life. And trusting Him for your eternal salvation. So here's my question to you this morning. Was there a time when you honestly realized that you were a sinner and admitted that to God? Was there a time in your life when you honestly realized that you were a person who, who an imperfect pe person who makes mistakes? Oh, maybe they're good mistakes. Right? Maybe they're good mistakes, but you're still, it's still a mistake. Do you truly understand that Jesus took your place on the cross? Do you understand that the real issue is not your sin, but the real issue is what you're going to do with Jesus? Have you received Christ alone for your salvation? God stands ready with the pardon in his hand. God sends nobody to hell. He just honors their choices to go. You want to change that? Receive God's pardon this morning. Would you pray with me? Father, being good enough is not enough good to get to heaven. I thank you for the pardon that you're offering us this morning. What better way to start a new year than to ensure that Jesus is Lord and Savior of our life? By admitting first that I'm a person who's not perfect, make mis who makes mistakes. And asking you, Father, to recognize what you already, to help me recognize what you already know. Not an imperfect person who makes mistakes. The Bible calls that a sinner. And I recognize that, Father. And I need your help. I recognize that too, Father. Maybe there's somebody here that recognizes those two things. But, Father, I ask that they'll accept the pardon that you're offering this morning. Because you're a gentleman. You don't enforce your will on us. And if it's our desire to go to hell, you let us. But I know the scripture says that that's not your, your desire. Your desire is for all to come to know you.
but you're not going to interject unless we're willing to come to you for that pardon. So help us to do that this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. In just a moment, we're going to sing a song called Jesus Paid It All. All to him, he paid, right? Your sins, our sins. And I owe that. All to him I owe. So as we're singing, we're going to sing three verses. You come as we sing. Let's all stand. It's easier to come. It's easy to move to God if you're standing. If you can stand, let's sing this this morning. <laughs>